This video is on a difficult topic. And if you're watching it because your parents are going through it, I feel for you. It's stressful. Uh, and the problem that we're trying to solve is parents who, or any loved one, or even yourself, really, um, if you did not know to or uh, procrastinated too long and didn't think about long-term care as being something that would happen to you, and now you're looking at $7,000 a month bills. The law firm record, by the way, for the most paid for long-term care for a month of care on a monthly basis, it's $30,000 per month. That was an eye-opener for me. Um, I have a lot of cases around the 18000 I shouldn't say a lot, a few. Um, 12000 maybe a couple dozen, and then a lot of cases at seven, eight K a month. So um, if you if you have a parent that did not plan ahead, did not buy long-term care insurance, don't feel bad. I mean, right now, I think the stats are 95% of Americans don't have uh, long-term care insurance. Um, and e even though the statistics are people over 65, 70% chance of needing some sort of long-term care, that figure, by the way, if you respond to it, react to it, Oh, as kind of like, no, that's not true. Not true. Uh, look, I've been looking at, I've been Googling that stat for 10 years. I've looked, I've, because to me, that seems high. Oh, I admit it. But every time I Google it, it's the same stat, basically. I've seen it around 65%, and it goes up. Um, and that's some sort of, um, I think it's actually residential care. Now, it doesn't say how long. Uh, a lot of people, die fast um, but you know i think 20 percent of people who go into um, care residential care spend five years or more so um that stat by the way co comes most recently from a governmental agency connected with medicaid and they so they have the numbers right so they kind of know so uh, the probability is high um, and the risk of loss so the risk of loss is high rather and the cost is high and your chances of getting in a car wreck are infinitely smaller, like a lot smaller than your chances of needing care. So I think we should take it seriously, uh, but we wanna talk about financing today. Like how do we pay for it if we didn't plan for it? This should be my tagline. And uh, it's, it's, hard, it's a complicated topic for, for a few reasons. First, um, somebody needs care. I mean, like the emotional part of it. The second part is the medical part. Like, you know, you have to figure out a few things on the medical side. And then of course the dollars and cents of it. Um, it's hard because there's only three ways to pay for long-term care. A and like, if you're a sort of person who, um, I don't know, just like has to understand something forwards and backwards, then you won't like this part. Um, or you will actually, um, but on the systems part, on the eligibility part, it's complicated on, on, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> how do you make a complicated idea easy to understand? My job sucks because I have to make a complicated statute, the Medicaid statute and the tax law and the tax code, like they're like tied for the first place for the most confusing English words ever put together by anybody. Shakespeare is easier to understand. <laughs> that would be cool if um, the tax code was in uh, like Shakespearean language. <laughs> I'm going to do a stick on that one day. That's the, the problem <laughs> that I have right now. Uh, there are only three ways to pay for care. That's it. It's simplistic. Like there, There's nothing more simple than three ways. That's it, period. Number one. You have insurance that rules out 95% of Americans. <laughs> so really it's only two. Uh, and those two ways are you write a check every month for care. I mean, how simple is that? Now, uh, as you'll see in the video today, um, Steve's mom, we have a, a, a real case, not a real case. It's not a law firm case. It's a family leaders case, but you know, she's only got $106,000. And she's at high level of care. And that's probably going to work for a while, but not forever. And so how do we protect retirement assets in the light of 
um, 10,000 bucks a month, 8,000, 4,500 bucks a month, whatever your number is. And so I'll teach you a very important thing in this video on how to analyze income. Um, the third way to pay for care is government programs. And that includes VA. Now we're not gonna talk about VA benefits today. We will in the future. Um, if your mom or dad is a veteran or a surviving spouse of a veteran, then pay attention because um, monthly income could really help. But um, Medicaid is a program. And when I use Medicaid, I mean all of those Medicaid-like programs, like state, state waiver programs. So um, let's jump into it. <clears throat> Mother-in-law's back in the hospital again. So now we're looking, starting the process that the counselor at the uh, hospital called. We're looking into, you know, possible placement for her. And you know, going starting that uh, with an unprepared person. So that'll yeah, be an adventure. What? Um... <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just don't understand, but. This is Daryl Tuttle, and the question is, what is Medicaid? I, I hear that all the time, and my clients are often confused, and rightly so, between Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare is a government program, just like Medicaid, and it is government health insurance, and Medicare is medical coverage for short-term illness. Right, yeah. So we're at that point, you know, she's got, so uh, I think she's got about $106,000 in a bank account and that's it. So the gal's looking, the, there's a home up by our house that's uh, a, a private home, but <clears throat> they're like, three-year uh, minimum self-pace. So, I mean, that's like. And, you know, there are many, many rules about Medicare, but basically it's, it's for all Americans who are over age 65 who have opted into Medicare and, and pay premiums. Medicaid, on the other hand, is for long-term care. So what is the difference between long-term and short-term? If you go to the Medicare website, which is medicare.gov, you will see that they say in their, on their website, Medicare does not pay for long-term care. And you will also discover that basically they define long-term as anything over 90 days a hundred it's a hundred days it was a hundred <laughs> days back then it's a hundred days now dumbass that has bothered me i made that video like when i was 12 years old look how how thin i am i mean i look like i'm wearing <laughs> my dad's suit <laughs> but this is the young daryl tuttle um giving people false information publicly. It's, it's 100 days, not 90. That's like, you might as well, you know. Well, what's her monthly shortfall? Yeah, her monthly shortfall, well, well she can do it for a year. She could sell pay for a year so well i think you're talking remember it's her it's the cost because now she's only, only going to have one bill right yeah so it's going to be what six seven thousand bucks yeah a, 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 absolutely right okay and, so it's seven seven k a month she probably only makes social security really all she has is a thousand dollars a month coming in for social oh, security. oh yeah okay so. yeah that that dog ain't gonna hunt
but that doesn't count against your when they talk about you got to spend down to two thousand dollars it if you've got a if that doesn't count if you have a i mean if you've got a thousand dollar a month pension that doesn't count against anything does it now in order to receive medicaid regulations require that two requirements are met the first is the medicaid applicant must be functionally eligible and that means that that the applicant must have a medical need in our state washington state Functional eligibility is determined by what is called a, an assessment. It's conducted by a worker from Medicaid in, in Washington, that's Department of Social and Health Services, and they will conduct an assessment on the Medicaid applicant. Now, of course, if a person's already in a nursing home, an, an assessment is not necessary because they're, they're in a nursing home. The other requirement that, that Washington has is that the Medicaid applicant must prove that they're medically indigent, which means limited income and limited assets. Okay, before we jump into the income analysis, I want to um, do the typical disclaimer, caveat type stuff. Um, Medicaid is a federal statute. It was enacted in 1965 and Medicaid is, fun, fun fact, <laughs> Medicaid is actually nursing home only, benefits for nursing home. However, the statute uh, allows each state to kick in their own dollars and petition for a waiver of the nursing home only requirement. Now, all states have a waiver program of some sort. And so your first step is to figure out what your state allows. Um, you know, I'm kind of a geek, so... I look into all 50 states, and I my I live in Puerto Rico now in, in semi-retirement, but my my state of I'm admitted to the Washington State Bar Association. Now, in Family Leaders, one of our um, pupils is talking about like the tax policy in Washington was so oppressive, she wanted to move to Wyoming, and Wyoming's beautiful. Get, don't get me wrong; it's one of my favorite places. Idaho, love it. Um, how, however, the tax environment in Wyoming is not as oppressive. Here's an interesting fact. Um, if you look at the uh, percentage, percentage, percentages of um, accepting it and relying upon federal aid for long-term care programs, the, the state that has accepted the least in terms of a percentage is Wyoming. However, Washington State's right behind it. I mean, it is so close. It's basically they're tied for having the honor of uh, kind of being independent of compared to, I think Mississippi was the worst state um, in terms of federal aid. And so tax policy means something. Um, I would say when I looked at Wyoming's policies on Medicaid and long-term care and waiver programs, I'm like, oh my God, don't don't age in Wyoming. Because <laughs> man, their idea is put you in the tent out in the sheep orchard. Uh, it's not funny. I, I like again, like before the Wyoming people jump on a plane and go to Puerto Rico and look for me. By the way, you, you're not going to blend in here. <laughs> so come on. You think Texas is bad as far as um, open carry? Everybody in Puerto Rico is armed. So <laughs> it's not funny. But um, so, like, you, you need to like understand the situation, the art and science of understanding the situation. My advice to you would be before you spend too much time jumping into the, the dollars and cents, figure out what your state can offer towards the end because eligibility is brutal, even in places where, um, okay, well, okay, except for California. California, by the way, apparently, they've always had high income limits and now apparently they're getting away, from walking away from the asset test completely. And so you could be a billionaire and, as I understand it, you could be a billionaire in California and, and get Medicaid. Now, it comes down to um, cost sharing and recovery and some other things, but there's got to be a reason for it. California has a very aggressive tax policy as does Washington State. And so the more tax you pay, the more benefits you can expect as you age if you run out of money, taking care of your own. Um, places that uh, kind of tout independence of the individual 
uh, the collective of the state really aren't going to be willing to share with you or you know take care of you. Uh, so don't spend any any time if at the tail end there's nothing available. That's the first step. Now, second step then is if if there is a possibility of some sort of um, program in which you can partner with Medicaid or a waiver program to prolong the quality of care of your loved one, then go ahead and then you're like jump into this analysis. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and let me explain kind of what, what I mean by that. Um, I think some people believe that you spend all of your money down to the Medicaid spend down limit and then you are impoverished and you go to a Medicaid mill. That view is so prevalent. I've gotten to the point where I really don't like spending very much time on it. Um, if you believe that, it's very hard to convince you otherwise. It, it com comes from, by the way, a few things. Number one, financial services. Um, I can think of a famous radio, television, YouTube personality um, who looks awful lot like me, but all bald men of the same age look the same. Gabe Ramsey and I are the, basically the same age. Um, the difference between the two of us really is um, his videos are amazing. Mine suck. And um, when I talk about long-term care, I actually know what I'm talking about and what I'm saying is accurate. So there's those two differences. But we could be twins. All I have to do is put on a glasses and treat people like crap um, and make them feel bad. Um, and then I'm, I'm Dave Ramsey. But what they will say is, Medicaid is for uh, poor people. You spend your money down to $2,000. There you go. The problem with that is um, the market. So the mind map you need to keep in mind is there are three types of models, if you will, of care communities. And that's what we're talking about is residential care. Mom can't stay at home anymore. Um, Steve, the hypothetical we just listened to, actually, it's not a hypothetical, it's real, is she stayed with Steve, who's probably the sweetest man I've ever met, and, and to the point where he couldn't take care, they can't do it anymore. Her, her needs are too high. And so she's gone from home to high, high level of care, adult family home. In some states, they call it group home. And while I applaud that, uh, it probably would have been better to analyze it earlier. And then assisted living, she could have graduated through the levels of care and maybe things would have turned out differently. Uh, maybe, maybe not. But the three models are, number one, we don't take Medicaid, not now, not ever. Don't ask. Now, I would say that, like, you, you need to extrapolate, can we afford $8,000 a month under the scenarios that I'm going to teach you here in a minute for how long? Forever. Now, uh, Bill Gates is a Washingtonian. So Bill Gates doesn't need to watch this video. I mean, like, it could be his lifetime, the lifetime of all his ancestors for, you know, forever. It's always going to be private pay. But uh, the median net worth of people 65 to 74 is only about $265,000. Um, most Americans are not very wealthy. The um, So you're usually looking at like one to five years, kind of that sort of range. Now, most people who go into care at, at that high level, uh, only 20% make it five years. So I hate as gruesome as it is, because it's your loved one, you kind of have to think about the dollars and cents of it will finance something for a certain time period. And the art of it is is life expectancy long or not? If, if you think that's morbid, there is science to life expectancy in terms of benefits, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But um, so Medicaid not now, not ever. If you think that you're going, going to run out of money, if there's any scenario, don't pick that place. Because when you can't pay on the first day of the next month at any community, uh, you're evicted. 
Now, there might be places that work with you if they, they want to work with you because they want to get to another funding source, in particular, the pocketbook of family members. Uh, one thing to look out for, too, is when you sign mom up for care, go through the contract and look and see if there's a personal guarantee provision. What that means is some of these communities are um, like they know that mom might be able to afford living here as long as their private pay time period or, or like she'll run out of money eventually. Right. And so they want to contractually bind family to pay mom's bills. And that may be a provision in the contract, or it might, it might even be a separate full page thing that would be analogous to like a promissory note in which they are trying to um, tie the kids to the bills. Now, our state um, has, the attorney general's has an opinion letter on that and deems it to be a consumer protection violation because what, what you're saying is, there's no legal obligation to cover mom's bills in the law. You're in crisis, take it or leave it. You either agree to pay for your mom's bills or we won't take your case. So that's a unilateral contract. So don't fall for that. If you see that, put a comment, send me an email. I'm not going to represent you, but I want to know about it. I, like how frequent is that? I want to hear the story. I'm getting worked up about that. The litigator in me is coming out, um, but I chose um, a transactional practice over time because I want a life peace. Now, um, the second model is, well, let me get back to the problem with the first model. The problem with the first model is the only place to go when, when you run out of money and you're no longer to pay mom's bills is a Medicaid mill. And so you've gone from kind of the super, super high end as you see it Way, way of care, your mom's gotten used to it. We can't afford the next month. She, she lived too long. It's called longevity risk. And now we have to go to, I've got friends who, run, who work at these places, so I've got to be nice, but a Medicaid mill would be the lowest uh, care, care level. The second business model is what you're looking for. Now the second business model, real, and most are the second business model. So you'll find a lot of them in your community. Uh, that model is we do take Medicaid, but we need to cover our bills so we have a, um, a private pay time period. Let me break that down. The Medicaid reimbursement rate is far lower than the private pay rate. What that means is when somebody comes into the community and rents a one bedroom apartment plus care in you know, assisted living, the amount that they can bill for a person who's on Medicaid is a, not a fraction. Yeah, it's a, a fraction of the amount that they can charge full price. And the, one of the reasons Medicaid or long term care is so expensive is because there's so many pe people aging and so many many people that need care, that there's a lot of times more demand than supply, but not always. And so, you know, and there's turnover rate. I mean, um, one to three years, people die. I mean, like, I, I to, so when I first started networking with people in the long-term care industry, I went out to, they, the happiest people in the world are people that work in salespeople in long-term care. It's weird. And so they're having this wine mixer for lawyers and different people who are in the um, profession in the community. And we're, you know, drinking our wine out of the plastic cup and eating our crackers. Ambulance shows up and we have to literally move aside while the ambulance goes up the elevator. And then there's a little bit of murmuring, but not much. Everybody goes back to having fun. And I'm like, should we be evacuating? <laughs> Is this a... 20 minutes later, they come out with a woman in, in the gurney. And the salesperson goes, there goes my percentages. <laughs> I'm like, what? She goes, well, I was at 92%. And if she dies, I'm only at 90% occupancy. And her salary's linked to that thing. So 
occupancy is like a big deal. If there's a low occupancy, they're like more willing to negotiate with you in some kind of, you know, deal. Not really, not often, but, you know, there's ways to do that. Now, the, the second business model is the most common, fine level of care. And they require you to pay for private pay at the full private pay rate for one to five years. Medicaid reimbursement rate is like, I think it's like 25%. Of course, it depends on the community, 25% or a third of the private pay rate. And so in order for them to pencil out, we have, we would make this amount of money at the um, full private pay rate. This is what our overhead is. And so, but we have a license for 25% Medicaid. So we have to charge more on the private pay rate to make the average cost pencil out so we can cover costs and make a profit. See what I'm saying? So that's important to kind of understand the mechanics behind it and why care costs are so high. In a way, it's related to Medicaid. Medicaid reimbursement's um, low. Can't blame Medicaid because Medicare is a heavy hitter. Social Security Administration is, and Medicaid has figured out how much it actually costs. The, the rest is, I'm not saying it's bloat, but the rest is bloat. And I find it interesting. I find it very helpful to understand what's kind of really going on in the minds of the party that I'm bargaining with. Like if it was my mom and I wanted to negotiate $7,000 a month, that's a lot of money. And if mom lives three or four years, I want to understand the mentality of the people sitting across the table. And it's not the salesperson. Like she just wants to get you in, read the glossy brochure. Where's my commission? That's jaded because they, they care, they're fun, they're nice people. However, the decision making at that level is higher up and they're concerned about profit. Now, um, if you run out of money using my analysis here in two years and you know that and the community that mom has her heart set on is a three year private pay time period, that means you have to pay $7,000 a month, whatever the, the fee is, for three years. If your spreadsheet says, we can only afford two and barely, you've got a decision to make. The thing I see people do, and these are smart people, um, they really don't think about any of it, really. Um, and what happens is they're evicted. I mean, like they, we can't stay here anymore. It was stressful just getting mom there. Think about how stressful it's going to be. She's evicted because we couldn't afford the full three years. And now we're in a Medicaid mill because that's the only place she can go. A Medicaid mill is the business model is to somehow attract all the Medicaid cases. Now, when you um, think about long-term care, if any of y'all use the term Medicaid bed, I'm going to flip out. <laughs> There's no such thing as a Medicaid bed. It's, it's not like... The law does not allow a nursing home. Oh, you're paying full rate? Okay, put her in wing A. All the Medicaid people are in B. And, you know, A is like gold doorknobs to get into the room. And the other one, the doorknobs fall off. Um, even though I have toured a Medicaid mill, and as we were opening the door, the doorknob did fall off. But that was a Medicaid mill. All the doorknobs in a Medicaid mill is that way. They do not discriminate based upon economic status. Uh, but in a, a private pay model, which is what you're looking for, the second one, it works because private pay for um, one to five years, and there's no difference under the, the law between um, services and furnishings for a person on Medicaid as compared to private pay. And so that's the way you can make mom more comfortable and have a higher level of care in an environment that you approve of until the finish line, if you do it right. If you do it wrong, then you're gonna be the exact same place that you did not want to go. So remember, the second business model is private pay time period, figure out what it is, and then do your spreadsheet. If you are gonna run out of money before, then don't worry about it. <clears throat> Third model I've always men already mentioned, um, um, Sometimes you, you just have to deal with a Medicaid mill um, if you can't afford it. And if you 
I've seen, I've actually seen really nice uh, Medicaid meals, especially at the um, nursing home level. But just think about how that works. Now, now let's talk briefly about the players, like who owns assisted living communities, uh, because it's important to understand that mentality. Um, there are four, four, three, three, four, I'd say four, okay, four different owners types. One, publicly traded companies. So I forget who it is now, Merrill Gardens, maybe. These are multinational corporations that are publicly owned, are publicly traded. So New York Stock Exchange will have Merrill Garden stock on it. And they have the kind of cookie cutter, they've commoditized long-term care services. And they are run by bean counters, like they want profit. Nothing wrong with profit. But when it comes to your mom, are you making a decision based on the, how fancy the lobby is in the beautiful fish tank? Or are you looking at the, the metrics and the analytics that matter. The number one thing that you should ask, and I guarantee you the salesperson behind the desk is going to squirm if you ask this question, and that is, what is your turnover rate for uh, long-term care provider workers, like the workers who provide care? Now, it's hard to ask difficult questions because you know the other person is going to squirm. If they're really good at not squirming, you can still tell they're not answering the question. And if it was my mom, I would say, look, I don't mean to be a jerk about it, but here, here's what YouTube says. YouTube says that the turnover rate for nurses in nursing homes is insane. <laughs> like it's like over 75%. It's a crazy amount. Like if Microsoft has a turnover rate of its employees over 7%, they're having a special emergency meeting. Whereas in long-term care, oh my goodness, Google it. It's a thing. And with with your with your parent, I mean, they've gone, they've just had all these things happen. Their husband died. Um, the only, she, the only, she, they live an isolated life. They're depressed. They broke a hip. They have to leave their home. And, and then they come to a community and finally, they get used to a face that they know and trust and like. And then the person quits. And then it's another person they know and trust. So they're constantly trying to adjust to the newness of life. And I'm telling you, people over 65, man, I mean, people say, like, seniors are being taken advantage of and, and, and whatnot. I'm like, really? Because... Every client meeting I've had over, with somebody over 65, man, I'm lucky to get out of there alive. <laughs> man, if you're over 80, I, don't, I stopped taking those meetings because I'm like, man, I don't want to be rolled by, you know, Betty. But it's not funny. Think, Just think about turnover and kind of insist on some statistics on that because that's the true mark of quality of care. It is not the fish tank in the lobby. In fact, the fish tank in the lobby should kind of alert you to the smoke and mirrors and the distraction. Okay, income. Uh, here's why income is important. I forgot to tell you the other um, owners. So one model is um, small privately owned communities. And so they are like, maybe they'll own, the last one I looked at was four. If they own four, smaller assisted living communities or whatnot. And they're not publicly traded, but they are concerned about profit. And so like the dollars that you spend, part of it goes to the pocketbook of the owner who's not in there scrubbing pots and providing care. There, there's a haircut, which in the like normal world, that's fine because that, we're all used to that. Everybody's got to make a profit. But compare that to communities that are owned by a charity. And they're not, there's not many, but there are a few. Um, in my hometown, I can think of two. One was owned by the Lutheran Church. And the actually, they were, they, they were both owned by the Lutheran Church. So I don't know what it is with L Lutherans, but they owned um, a CCRC, which is all levels of care in one campus, and then an assisted living facility. And they had the best deal in, in town. 
in, in terms of private pay rate. They also had the smallest time period. Uh, like um, King's Manor was only a 12 month time, time, a private pay time period. Whereas a lot of other places that are um, profit driven are at three years or two, three to five years. So if the owner is not really trying to make as much of a profit, they got to cover their expenses, certainly. But if there's a charitable thing, then, you know, that works. Uh, and the other category is very hard to find, but sometimes you'll find a, like a governmental community, VA in particular. So in my state, the state's VA owns and operates a nursing home. So that's pretty cool. Of course, you have to be a VA to get in there, but you see my point. Um, great price because it's being provided as a benefit to those who served. Those are the four types. I talked about the business model. You don't screw up the private pay requirement. Let's jump into the um, spreadsheets and I'll show you why income is important, important. Okay, onto the, onto the spreadsheet. Um, I made this eight years ago as part of my uh, practice. It is the first of two. The second template, which I won't um, share today, is the massive template. It, it can calculate every conceivable, okay, not every, but uh, most key points in a Medicaid application and a VA application, in particular for married people, that spreadsheet can calculate community spouse resource allowance and whether or not you're entitled to an increase in the amount that the well spouse can keep. It's pretty cool. But this is what you want to do, something similar to this. You want to um, create a spreadsheet in which you are um, tracking some, anal I'm going to use the term analytics just because I like the sound of that word, but um, it, it, it's a, a word that, it, it's, you know, like what VA might want, what Medicaid might want, and what we need in terms of figuring out if, if we have any ability to finance care, what the parent's contribution is going to be, what the family's contribution is going to be, and whatnot. And so if you look at some of the things I'm tracking here, life expectancy matters. Um, it, it matters in terms of, it really matters in a VA application. Um, Medicaid is also tracking a life expectancy. And these are based on tables. Strangely enough, the tables between VA and Medicaid are different. <laughs> life expectancy tables are different. Um, so um, calculate date, age, VA, VA life expectancy and Medicaid life expectancy. Now, um, when we merge basic information, we also are looking at activities of daily living. So you can create your own assessment until you get a real assessment, but pull from the assessment that you get from a third party or from uh, even the Medicaid agency's uh, assessment, these, these key points. But what you wanna know is activities of daily living and activities of daily living are used by uh, long-term care insurance companies and Medicaid and VA. And also the uh, the care plan at your community. If, if it's an assisted living facility or an adult family home or group home, as it, as it may be called in your state, what they want to do is create a path for care. What, what does this person need and how are we going to provide it? Activities of daily living very unfortunately, which Congress passed a law, look, everybody has to use this template, but it's just one of the things you have to deal with. And activities of daily living, um, such thing as this one was on locomotion, had difficulty uh, moving, but like moving from bed to a wheelchair is a big deal. That's called transferring, um, eating, dressing, et cetera. And if you can, order yourself an assessment from a third party. Now, uh, on the financial side, I, I say this because, like, one of the key points is that I, you have to think in terms of how much expenses are going to increase. And expenses are going to increase. There's always at least 5% bump annually, no matter what. And in addition, it's not uncommon for um, an, an aging and failing parent 
to burn through, start with one, and end up with all seven, and then graduate to the next level of care. So they might move from home care to or even independent living to assisted living, and then memory care, and then a nursing home. So, you know, that's one of the, the points of the financial data um, entry. So, and then lay down um, your financial data in, in this format. What we, what we need to track is gross income, net income, and then UMEs. This stands for unreimbursed medical expenses. So these are things that Medicare does not cover or insurance does not cover. This is like you're out of pocket. Um, this case wasn't too bad. It was 5K. Unfortunately, uh, the spouse in this case was at home. That's like the nightmare scenario. One, one spouse is in care and the other one's at home. Actually, the nightmare scenario is one spouse is in high level of care. And the other one falls and ends up in assisted living. That's how you get to $12,000 a month. But it's not uncommon for a single person to have five to 8000 bucks in unreimbursed medical expenses. By the way, just to give you context, that's $63,000 a year. That's what, that's the problem we're trying to solve. And so think about these key points, unreimbursed medical expenses. What are the non-medical expenses, regular and recurring um, income tax? You got to factor that in and then just miscellaneous costs, um, air on the side of overdoing instead of underdoing, right? Now on net worth, let's see what we have here. Um, net worth, uh, let's see, go down. Also, um, on the super duper spreadsheet, I break down the way all of the deductions and all of the different categories that Medicaid, uh, how they treat income. Some things, basically most of it matters, uh, but there are some little nuances in how different sorts of income are treated. It's different than the tax code. And so, you know, you're not going to get a unified credit, <laughs> nothing like that is in Medicaid at all. Um, primary residence. So this this matters quite a bit. One of the differences between Wyoming and Washington, if I failed to mention it, um, a prime, when you apply for Medicaid, of course, you all know about the spend downs. You have to have assets below a certain amount. But a primary residence does not count as an asset. That's amazing. It's an exempt um, asset. Now, um, how, however, it's just the equity in the residence. In Washington, the equity limit is over a million dollars, which just because, you know, there's like a lot of wealth in Washington, I guess, on the West Side in particular, and the um, price of homes has really increased. And so a million dollar home is what a $500,000 home was 10 years ago, essentially. But Wyoming is still down at that um, $500,000 mark as part of their uh, Medicaid program. So that's a real example of the difference in jurisdiction. You can protect a lot more in Washington than you can Wyoming. Sorry, guys, but it's just a fact. Um, the income limits in Washington is over $9,000 a month for a COPES program. Medicaid institutional um, nursing home is different. But $9,000 in income is a super high income threshold. I, as I understand it, Wyoming's still below the kind of the old $2,000 mark. Um, so I don't know what Wyoming's going to do about that, but I guess it works for them. Um, like I said, it's the uh, tent and the sheep orchard. Now, um, and then what you want to do is just put down all of your, um, the value of all your assets and calculate Medicare premiums and institutional fees and, and all this. You want to track, be very, very granular as to these data entries on assets and income. Now, then make your spreadsheet so it's tracking year by year what the cash outflow is going to be for five years. Why do we choose five years? Because there's a five-year look back period, right? And so that works for pro proactive planning. And it works for crisis. And proactive planning, what you're trying to figure as, out is, okay, there's a five-year look-back period. Can I make a transfer? And if you run out of money within the five years, then you need to know that. Now, in, in a crisis case, 
you're trying to figure out, can I make it through the private pay time period? And we'll just choose five years because a lot of the high-end communities have a five-year private pay time period. Um, most Americans are looking at a one to three um, year time period. And so your spreadsheet is going to tell you how it works. In this particular case, these folks run out of money in year three, right? They're in, they're in the negative. That's a big problem. Now, remember that um, everything's going to increase in cost. And so then run your spreadsheet again, assuming a 10% increase in expenses, just across the board. Don't, don't argue about inflation, all this other stuff. Actually, in, in today's inflationary times, I'd run a 15%. But now what we're trying to figure out is if, if mom's care goes up and the cost goes up, then 10%. How does the five-year analysis work? And this is basically a Monte Carlo simulation, right? Um, but it's still in, in, in year three, um, which is weird, but spreadsheets don't lie. <clears throat> and then let's look at scenario 25%. Okay, now, now we got problems because we ran out of money just at the tail end of two years. So basically we can afford two, two years, worst case, not worst case, but like a bad scenario would be two years. And if you choose a three-year community, you're taking a risk because I've seen I've seen care costs double in two years, which would be 100% increase. So, you know, run the different analysis depending upon your risk aversion and um, keep track of how income works because cash in cash out cash in cash out also when you are calculating income on these spreadsheets make sure that you include a rate of return if you have investments that have a rate of return you got to kind of factor in how the assets deplete and you have to factor in uh how they appreciate with rate of return most people who are in like long-term care is a world upside down because the convention is do not invest in stocks. It, as you age, you you invest in risky investments less and less. And most of the seniors I see, they don't have financial advisors anymore. Fired those guys a long time ago. This is like age 75 plus and maybe 5% of people over 80 have financial advisors. They they What I've seen is CDs and money market so basically, they're not, they're not chasing return anymore, which is the, the correct approach. However, in in um, like if your if your spreadsheets tie on, on the private pay time period, well, then you might be looking at going a little bit more aggressive. You know that that's up to you. But just think about um, these figures. Look at the inflationary rate I chose back then. Uh, I just wrote inflation twenty five percent, but that 25% figure that, that I put in there, this is back in the days when there's basically no inflation, like 3% was rate of return. And for an octogenarian, it was a wash with uh, the inflationary rate of 25%. But for me, the, the mind map was 25% increase in care costs just across the board. To be accurate, we're looking at what, 7% inflation, maybe 8% inflation right now at the time I made this video. So really you should be running, I should have, if I if I ran this today, I would run a 35% increase in cost. And that would definitely um, deplete within year two solidly. And that means I'm looking at a one year, it means I'm looking at a one year uh, private pay time period, probably from an outfit run by a charity. See how that worked? Okay, that's it. Um, I've got a lot more to say. Uh, you should see my, super super duper spreadsheet if you want to if you want me to do more I, i've got to get some feedback to see if you think it's worth it so a couple likes a couple shares whatnot and then um to me that's worth it